Hello, everyone. My name is Guillaume uh, Vallet. I am professor of uh, economics at uh, the University of uh, Grenoble Alpes, uh, France. And uh, it's my pleasure today to, to chair uh, this uh, session with uh, Professor Matthias uh, Vernengo. Uh, Matthias Vernengo is a uh, professor of economics at the Bucknell University, USA. He is also the uh, co editor of the review of uh, Keynesian Economics. And uh, today we'll uh, present a very uh, interesting uh, paper on uh, the following title Was Keynes a liberal or a socialist? Uh, Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me first thank Sema and the organizers and Guillaume for chairing the session. Uh, so, this is actually a talk that I, I gave before uh, earlier this year at um, the um, Franklin and Marshall uh, College, uh, uh, the Will Lyons Lecture. And, and uh, before I start, you know, uh, what I want to say is, you know, uh, first of all, why I think it's a relevant question, which I think it's, uh, it's an important thing to be said. So somebody may say, so who cares whether Keynes was a, a liberal or a socialist? I think that uh, a, a good chunk of the recent discussions, there, there, there is a discussion that I think it's relevant, uh, that in particular has been more recently brought up by, by uh, James Crotty, and I highly recommend his book. In many ways, my, my talk is uh, uh, a conversation with, with that book. Um, uh, an author that indirectly, I wasn't his student or anything like that, you know, has influenced me quite a bit. Um, and uh, but there is also a significant uh, discussion of whether Keynes was, uh, um, you know, a socialist. Uh, so, so I should say, Crowdy does think he was a socialist. But from from arguments that suggest that Keynes was a socialist, from from a critical um, sort of perspective, as a sort of a tarnish on his legacy. So I think it's important to discuss uh, uh, for that particular reason. And in many ways, what I want to say is something that. Uh, I, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's not uh, the conventional sort of view on, 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 on Keynes, when I'm or, or for that matter, what I'm gonna say right now on, on Marx, and I will conclude with that, but I, I want to say that at, at the start. I think that Marx, uh, contrary to what, including some Marxists think, he embraced uh, classical political economy in a critical way, uh, but he embraced classical political economy to show that uh, the economic system, the capitalism was doomed. Uh, and I think that Keynes did uh, the exact opposite, that Keynes, uh, he broke from uh, the dominant uh, economic theory of his time, which was not classical political economy. Uh, it was marginalism, of course, or tried to break with and, and succeeded uh, in part in breaking with classical political, uh, with, uh, pardon me, marginalism in order to save capitalism from itself. And so, so uh, one embrace theory to show capitalism uh, was doomed and socialism was needed. The other in, you know, broke with theory to suggest that uh, the system was uh, bound to be saved. And so uh, what I, I will try to do is uh, I, I very briefly discuss some, some of the issues related to biography and the history of ideas, because obviously here we're, we're talking of, of an issue that it's not strictly speaking, uh, you know, uh, analytical uh, from the point of view of, of economics, we're discussing, you know, Keynes' views on what broadly can be termed political economy. Uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit of vision and analysis and distinctions of those, of course. <clears throat> I'm going to discuss Keynes' uh, break, uh, to what extent with marginalism, and Keynes' views on, on socialism and liberal, you know, you know and, and the term that he uses, he uses the term liberal socialist, uh, and some brief concluding uh, remark remarks. So, so that that's the <clears throat> pardon me, the plan of, of my talk. And and so um, Virginia Woolf, you know, which uh, was of course part of the Bloomsbury Group and 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 a close friend uh, uh, of Keynes, uh, said famously, you know, uh, writing uh, on the art of uh, of biography uh, that. Um, that, and I, I quote here, suppose, for example, that uh, a man of genius was immoral, ill-tempered, and threw books at the maid's head. The widow would say, still I loved him, he was the father of my children, and the public <clears throat> who loved his books must on no account be disillusioned, cover up, omit. The biographer obeyed. And thus the majority of Victorian biographies are like wax figures now preserved in Westminster Abbey, that were carried in funeral processions through the street 
effigies that have only a smooth superficial likeness to the body in the coffin. And she, you know, she essentially uh, <clears throat> was discussing the, uh, the biography of uh, Queen Victoria uh, and the works uh, in general of Lytton Strachey, another sort of uh, colleague of Keynes at Bloomsbury and, and the Apostles and Cambridge and so on and so forth, same circles uh, <clears throat> that had, you know, sort of, um, you know, written on uh, the lives of eminent Victorians, as he called them, and, and had shown uh, the sort of inner life and, and uh, rather than the sort of hero account of, of their lives. And, you know, in many ways, uh, Lord Skidelsky, uh, who was, you know, I think presenting or will present in the conference, uh, uh, you know, basically has done to some extent that for uh, Kane's uh, biography. Uh, he has shown uh, not just uh, issues of Kane's sexuality, but, you know, all of this sort of inner, uh, inner sort of uh, <clears throat> movements of, of Kane's uh, sort of life, secret life, if you want. Uh, and he did suggest that Roy Harrod's famous biography, which was published, one should always remember, while both parents of Keynes were still alive, uh, or at least the mother was alive, perhaps the father had, you know, passed away, but uh, in the early 50s, that, uh, you know, it was an exercise in covering up, uh, in planting false traits. Uh, I should say on that, that Rod O'Donnell, so Crotty is not the first to, to suggest this, Crotty doesn't say that, uh, uh, that uh, Skidelsky uh, failed, but of course he disagrees with Skidelsky's account. But Rod O'Donnell is pretty explicit and suggests that uh, that Skidelsky he has failed in a similar way, and and the reason for that is that Herod, you know, as much as Herod, he depicts uh, he depicts Keynes as a as a liberal rather than as a socialist. Uh, oh, oops, let's see if I can. There we go. And, and as, as I said, there, there are, you know, uh, many cases in, in which you have a sort of uh, alternative authors, you know, some, some on the right, like uh, Edward Fuller, uh, that suggests that Keynes uh, was indeed a socialist. So he agrees with, uh, with uh, Crotty and, and O'Donnell, uh, but sees that as part of a general tendency of um, reformist authors during the progressive uh, era and you know, the subsequent era in the United case, case of the United States, it will be the progressive era and the New Deal eras, uh, in which, uh, you know, those, those authors were uh, influenced and those, you know, some of those socialist ideas influenced by, by certain views on, on population and on eugenics. And, and it's ultimately seen as, uh, you know, as the result of an illiberal view uh, of the world. And that, you know, um, um, in, in that particular sort of worldview, uh, Hayek uh, would be the sort of uh, staunch defender of uh, the classical, if you want, liberalism, a term that I think it's absolutely fraught with, uh, with problems. Um, and, um, uh, and, and that it's, it's done in a critical way. So it, it, it's uh, to suggest that Keynes uh, was a problematic author. Uh, and yeah, certainly there are you know, problematic issues in, in Keynes. Uh, um, and you have on the other hand, radicals that suggest that Keynes was uh, not a so socialist, not even a liberal, but that he was a, a conservative. Uh, and you know, Michael Roberts, you know, well-known Marxist author would be you know, sort of, uh, uh, in that tradition, you know, suggesting that, uh, you know, the, the fact that he wants to preserve capitalism, even if it's a reformed uh, version of capitalism, suggests that, you know, his aims are conservative. Uh, and, and again, I think that uh, Keynes' uh, writings and, and ideas, and, you know, both in, in theory and in policy, suggest, uh, suggest otherwise. So I think that the more interesting and serious argument comes, uh, at least more recently, and here I would put also Rod O'Donnell's sort of views on this, uh, come from James Crotty uh, that suggests that uh, you know Keynes was indeed a socialist, but sees that uh, uh, in the sort of light that I suppose in the world that we now are living, you know, a world with uh, at least in the United States, uh, but you know globally I suppose uh, with the pandemic and the last economic crisis, uh, more acceptance of a role of the state, but certainly in the United States with Bernie Sanders bringing back the word socialism to you know uh, some sort of uh, uh, positive place in the spectrum of, of uh, you know, uh, ideas. And Crowley tells us uh, it's almost universally believed that Keynes wrote his magnus opus, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, to save capitalism from the socialist, communist, and fascist forces that were rising up during the Great Depression era. 
This book uh, argues that he that this his book, so Crowdy's book, I should say, was not uh, the case for with respect uh, to socialism. The historical record shows that Keynes wanted to replace that then current capitalism in Britain with what he referred to liberal socialism. So to some extent, uh, that, that's the argument uh, that I think it's the strong argument, the argument that I will, uh, to some extent, counter, not, not the others that seem to me, as I said, more fanciful and, and less relevant. Um, and, and I have great, great respect for, for as I said, uh, this particular argument. Uh, so to some extent, and I have to mind my time, so I'm, I'm going to jump a little bit on this. Um, but uh, we're dealing with issues of, uh, of vision and analysis, you know, the, the famous distinct, distinction uh, that in the history of economic ideas is brought by, by Schumpeter, that is also discussed uh, heavily by uh, Robert Hellbronner and, and his, uh, you know, uh, writings. Uh, of course, Hellbronner was a student of, of Schumpeter at Harvard. Uh, before he went to the new school and, and worked with Lowe and, and so on and so forth. And you had some discussion of that with Matt uh, Forstater in, you know, in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, presentation. But um, so th there is some sort of understanding here that uh, these two things are not completely separate, so to speak, and I'm not going to go too much into this, but you know, that vision and analysis, so that vision does affect uh, analysis and it's central for the greatness of these economists as, as you know, as Hilbronner suggested in, in the world of philosophers. And, and Crowdy says that you know, Keynes' views, which are formed fundamentally in, in early uh, you know, stages of, of his um, interventions in economics as an economist, when he works at the treasury during the First World War and when he, in the uh, treaties of, of Versailles, uh, decides to, to leave the British delegation and write a uh, scathing uh, you know, uh, attack on, on, the, on the peace. Uh, you know, the, the famous economic consequences of the peace, that uh, it, it's there that, you know, he sort of changes his views, that these views inform his changes in policy, that those are, you know, based on, on some ideas that James explicitly cites there on, on, uh, on the basis of the work by uh, American institutionalist John R. Commons, that, you know, the, the world had emerged uh, from the First World War. Uh, the world that had emerged was a different world, a world that uh, had little in connection with, with the Victorian world uh, that went before. Uh, and, and I think one can go even further than that. I, you know, I, I would suggest that, you know, it's not said in Crotty, but I think that here what you have is Keynes reflecting whether he had an understanding of not, uh, or, or, of that or not, but I think he did. And you can glance some of those things in his writings. I don't cite here, but it's, you know, part of that it's in the paper I'm writing. That that he had an understanding that uh, the hegemonic position of England was was waning, and and so that the uh, the central sort of a change is not a change that affects uh, you know uh, in just the the capitalist system um, in England, but it does affect the, the capitalist system on a global basis, and that it's the rise of the United States as a hegemonic power that sort of. Uh, really is central to understand the change in views of Keynes during uh, the 1920s. I, I would say there is a parallel here, and you know, this is related to other work of mine, and I'll have to really rush. This presentation was supposed to be longer at, uh, you know, when I first presented it. But um, uh, with the work of Raoul Previch, or another author that during this period sort of changed significantly uh, his, his views. Um, and, and I think, you know, in, in particular for Keynes, and I briefly want to emphasize this because I think it's important because uh, I think it informs his changes in view, although those take uh, a while to sort of uh, um, come to full fruition. Uh, it's the role of debt, in particular of foreign debt. England was for the first time indebted in foreign currency and that with the role of deflationary forces is what eventually leads him to the general theory and the need to um, break up with says law and embrace the idea of effective demand. So, so that's part of his battle to uh, escape from old ideas. But here I want to say a couple of things very, very fast because uh, I don't want to, I, I, I will not have time to get you know, bogged down on, on the details of this. But um, these ideas, I think it's very clear when the theoretical ideas do change in Keynes. We know precisely this stuff. So we do know that Keynes views on effective demand and, and his abandonment of conventional views about the adjustment between investment and savings happen around 1932. So they happen way after he has been defending you know, for the whole 20s. 
policies that can be seen as alternative and Keynesian, abandoning the gold standard, promoting uh, f- you know, fiscal policy expansion and public works. And all of those things you know, were sort of uh, before, um, before he developed uh, uh, in 1932 those ideas. They, um, you know, the idea, for example, of a multiplier uh, appears in, in 1929 in one of those. I have those two pamphlets, so, so those are the original pamphlets. Um, and um, and uh, the, um, the <clears throat> um, Ken Lloyd George do it from 1929 already has the policy proposals. Uh, there, but it doesn't have the theory. The first time that the theory does appear is in the means to prosperity in 1933. Uh, and, and that's the, the one that uh, sort of uh, Keynes, uh, even before the general theory, defends the kinds of ideas that will become known uh, in theory, I should say. So, so that, you know, the idea that the system does not have a tendency to full employment in the long run, understood here, the long run, not as growth. So capital is not growing, but simply as um, you know, the fact that prices and wages are flexible. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, very briefly on this, he, here I want to emphasize where I disagree with this. So I'm going to jump the, you know, some of the comments that are here, but I want to emphasize where I disagree with Crotty. So Crotty tells us that the true Keynesian revolution in theory, in theory and policy began not with the general theory and other writings of, in the 1930s, but rather with the publication of his book, the economic consequences of the pain of the peace uh, in 1920. So 1919, uh, you know, 1920. In policy for sure, <clears throat> but he's certainly wrong in theory. So in theory, as I just told you, Keynes clearly, you know, only, only breaks after uh, the Macmillan Committee, uh, after, um, you know, uh, Pigou points out that uh, his theory does not support his, uh, you know, his policy actions in, in the way he defends them. And after the Circus Group, another important group in Keynes, in Keynes story, you know, with uh, Strafa and John Robinson and Austin Robinson and uh, Richard Kahn, uh, you know, suggests to him that, uh, you know, it's, and James Mead, I should say, uh, suggest to him that uh, he needs to be thinking in terms of this other way of adjusting investment and savings and that that would be compatible with changes in the level of, uh, uh, of the quantities rather than uh, of, of prices, which was what his theory uh, sort of suggested. So, um, and again, very briefly, so Keynes uh, is trying to break clearly with marginalism. How do we know this? He's very explicit and tells us that the idea of a natural rate of interest that he considered correct and good and uses in the treaties on money, 1930, that he's using in, and, and defending in the treaties on money uh, uh, in, during the Macmillan Committee, pardon me, in 31, uh, that uh, you know, those ideas have to be abandoned. So, so Keynes is explicit about that. Uh, and so much so that, you know, um, if you think uh, of some of the criticism, I'm going to have it later on, but you know, I think I have it uh, somewhere there before uh, in his discussion of Hayek, you know, that, that Keynes is seen as changing a lot of his mind because uh, he, although he maintains still the same policy propositions during the 30s, he defends them from a different theoretical perspective and, and probably I won't have time to show the, the Hayek quote on that. But Hayek uh, in part uh, passed the myth that Keynes was inconsistent, you know, uh, uh, more than just changing his views, exactly for that reason, because Keynes changed his views in the middle of, of the debate about the causes of the Great Depression with them. Um, so, um, so I, I should say that um, Keynes does have, and, and some marginalist ideas remain in there. So, so that, that's important also to remark. Uh, so there are certain things that uh, you know he, he tells us uh, it's uh, that's a difficult part, parting with the old ideas. So some ideas remain there, but uh, from my point of view. The important thing is that he wanted to sort of um, definitely get rid of marginalism, understood the importance of that, and, and certainly tried to do that. And, and I think that several of his ideas are compatible, particularly, more importantly, the idea of effective demand with classical political economy and with Marx's uh, critical reading of classical political economy. And I think that that's an important sort of element. Theories that, by the way, although, for example, Ricardo had says law, didn't imply uh, full employment of labor. So, so that those things, the markets did not produce optimal outcomes in that particular sense. And also even when they assumed that capital you know, was fully utilized, uh, they didn't presume that investment and savings did have a mechanism of adjustment. So it was simply assumed. So um, that was liable of being changed by uh, an alternative uh, theory.
So uh, turning to, to the issue here, so uh, of Keynes and, and, and his vision and, and the idea of uh, socialism. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's important to, to remember that, uh, you know, uh, again, that Keynes uh, was as uh, Peter Clark, which I think is one of the, the best sort of interpreters of, of the history of the Keynesian uh, revolution in policy. Uh, he's a historian, not an economist or economic historian. Peter Clark says that, uh, you know, correct, I think, that, uh, that uh, like Marx, uh, you know, Keynes was, uh, you know, uh, uh, he thought that it was not enough for philosophers to understand the world. The point was that uh, they had to change it. Um, and the important thing here is, you know, he also tells us why Keynes, uh, uh, you know, remained, I should say, formally speaking, and that's what I think I say here, uh, you know, he remained a liberal. He never became a socialist, uh, formally connected with the uh, Fabian socialists. He never, uh, you, know, vote, you know, never voted or never, I should say, joined Labour Party. Uh, he remained uh, an Asquith liberal. And, and what uh, Peter Clark uh, says, I think correctly, is if you think of, of uh, conservatives at this point, they're willing to break with, uh, with uh, some of the dogmas of, 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 uh, of po in policy, dogmas of, of, of the conventional view. So in particular with free trade um, and labor economists, uh, you know, the, uh, not labor, the field, labor, labor party economists, um, um, we're willing to also with break in with uh, some rules, uh, but you know, um, and and they saw all of these problems that you know appeared. So one, you know, it's uh, it, they're worth breaking to save capitalism. The other, you know, uh, these are side effects of capitalism, and they were trying to move away slowly, uh, you know, to a less capitalist society. Um, but um, but they are both unable to to change uh, on sound finance. And, and as Clark uh, reminds us. It was the liberals uh, uh, historically identified with free markets. So, so Asquith and then Lloyd George, uh, who took the most radical line. Uh, and that's exactly, uh, you know, um, Keynes uh, uh, sort of um, uh, concern. So uh, as I said, the, the most important sort of, uh, uh, of indication of why Keynes remained, uh, remained uh, a socialist, uh, uh, liberal, is that he never he never changed uh, he never changed parties he remained uh, you know um, um, somewhat of a, a liberal uh, I um, have a phrase here I'm going to jump a little bit um, there is a famous phrase that you know everybody on this uh, sort of quotes um, that you know suggests that Keynes uh, was radical but radical in the sense that you know Peter Clark told us uh, he says I'm sure that I am less conservative than the average labor voter and probably true. I fancy that I have played in my mind with the possibilities of greater social changes than come within the present philosophies of Mr. Sidney Webb, Mr. Thomas, or Mr. Whitley. Um, the Republic of my imagination, this is the famous quote, lies uh, to the extreme left of the celestial space. And almost everybody that quotes this and wants to suggest he's a socialist, they stop right there. And what follows is it, the part that I think it's uh, sort of relevant in this context. Yet, all the same, I feel that my true home, so long as they offer a roof and a floor, is still with the liberals. And, and Crowdy himself, uh, that, you know, uh, recognizes, uh, you know, uh, some of the ambiguities in Keynes says, well, Keynes wanted to preserve uh, what, what uh, Keynes wanted to preserve, what Keynes, probably it's, it's something is missing there, was an economic system that would uh, sustain Britain's existing social, cultural, and political way of life. So in, in many ways, it seems that, um, um, that Keynes, in fact, indeed wanted uh, to preserve capitalism from uh, itself. So um, Keynes remained a liberal, I should say, uh, even after the complete demise of uh, the Liberal Party. So by 1924, liberals have won an election. They went, win again in 29. So it's not Boy George that uh, will do it. Uh, and certainly Labour didn't do it because it wasn't in their proposals. So it was sound finance. They're forced out of uh, the gold standard, which Keynes was happy. Um, they are uh, forced out in, in a, you know, uh, in a coalition government, Ramsey MacDonald, uh, as it's well known, and the Liberal Party, uh, you know, uh, in a very popular book of the time, uh, you know, uh, basically vanished. The Strange Death of uh, Liberal England uh, is, uh, is the book. Um, and um, I think that uh, th that fact that he remains a liberal has to be understood also uh, in, in terms of another sort of important element of, uh, of Keynes sort of general outlook, that he was the product uh, of, 
of uh, you know he, his upbringing. So he was an elitist. Uh, he was the product of Eton and Kings. Uh, he was a member of you know secret elite societies like the Apostles. Uh, he was a member of Bloomsbury. And, 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 and certainly he was not a conservative or afraid of change. He was for radical experimentation, but he thought exactly that radical experimentation had to come with um, and preserve the uh, individualist uh, liberal sort of values that he, he came to um, sort of uh, uh, associate with, with uh, civilization. Uh, and that's why he never sort of joined uh, the socialist cause. But yeah, in conclusion, what, what uh, you know, it's important here is that in order to get that defense of the capitalist system that he wanted to preserve uh, and to show that the system, uh, you know, could with some degree of management from the state uh, produce full employment and, and uh, you know, uh, avoid the revolution that he saw you know, in other parts of the world, he had to break up with the theories of, of his teachers. And so, so, um, you know, uh, in a sense, what I told you at the beginning, Marx embraced uh, in a critical manner the dominant Ricardian classical political economy of his time in order to show that capitalism was, uh, you know, doomed to, to fail. And Keynes tried to break with the conventional, now marginalist or neoclassical theories uh, of his teachers, of uh, Pigou and Marshall, to demonstrate that the bourgeois society could indeed be saved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, and personally, I have learned uh, a lot of things. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a, a question, if I may, because we just have uh, three three minutes. So uh, I will uh, ask you maybe yes, for a brief, very brief answer. <laughs> but you, you mentioned uh, John R. Commons and uh, his connection uh, with uh, Keynes, uh, if I am right. And uh, Commons was uh, close to Richard uh, Ely in the U.S., and my question is, um, was Keynes interested in the German uh, historical school? Uh, because the German historical school was very uh, influential to Commons uh, and Ely, of course, and uh, I wanted to know more about that. Uh, did Keynes uh, read, read uh, some papers or books from uh, G the German historical school? Thank you, Matthias. Oh, I, I, you know, I, I certainly cannot tell you explicitly what, what he read or didn't read of the, the German historical school. I mean, uh, it, it is, uh, so that's a good question uh, in and of itself. I, I, you know, it is clear that, uh, that the, the, there is a British sort of discussion of historicism, uh, you know, the historical school and, and sort of marginalism. Uh, and in Marshall, uh, at least uh, that discussion is way, uh, Marshall had in many ways uh, a sort of non-confrontational and, and evolutionary view of, uh, of the history of ideas. He did think that uh, his theories were, you know, in, in direct, uh, you know, descent from Ricardo through, through Stuart Mill, so that there was continuity. Uh, and that is reflected in Keynes uh, to some extent in, in his use of the term classical economics, although Keynes does use the term neoclassical in the general theory with a hyphen neo separate classical and he uses it correctly. He shows that the classical authors did not have a, um, a mechanism for, for the uh, adjustment of savings and investment and the neoclassicals did have, so, so he uses the term appropriately. Uh, and so my, my guess, you know, if I have to say so, and, and Keynes certainly was, uh, was aware of this debate. So, so that those debates in England, and I'm pretty sure he was aware of those debates in, in, in you know, uh, with the Austrians and, and Germans and whatnot. Uh, I, I tend to think that, you know, again, his elitism would make him see almost everything as somewhat per peripheral. So, so if it didn't happen in Cambridge, it wasn't too central, but I, I might be wrong on that. Uh, but but he certainly suggests uh, that he read Commons and and that um, and, and so indirectly at least because as you said uh, American institutionalism uh, all of them uh, even Veblen indirectly because all his teachers had gone to Germany you know and Johns Hopkins which is right here where I am uh, uh, you know was a central place for that for Eli and and whatnot certainly uh, certainly all, all of those uh, were things that influenced him. Thank you very much, Matthias. Well, thank you. For uh, unfortunately, I think we have to stop here. But uh, once again, thank you very much. Your presentation was insightful. So thank you for your contribution. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care, guys. Thank you very much, Professor. Well,